Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Hi, Chris. Welcome to Talking Coco. Talks. <laughs> yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you're welcome. So you work for a charity called Future Men. That's right. And it is a multi-award winning specialist charity that supports boys and men. Mm -hmm. And basically your mission is to inspire boys and men to become uh, dynamic future men by giving them the confidence to discover what it means to be a man. Yes. It's quite a good mission. Yes. <laughs> yes. And there's there's a circularity within the within the mission. And the vision is a better future for every boy, every man and everyone. So it's an inclusive mission okay. um, that is not uh, sex specific. Um, if this is not the, the organization's perspective, but it would be mine that 10 years ago we saw Emma Watson standing in front of the UN talking about he for she. Mm -hmm. And that is very much where we're coming from. It is not exclusive. It's inclusive. So, Chris, what motivated you to become part of this um, charity? That's a big question. Um, y y you can hear that I'm not born of DCs. Uh, I was born slightly west of here um, in Connecticut, um, just north of New York City. And um, we came over as a nuclear family in 1984. So I've lived here for 40 years, okay. which um, many people say my accent does not indicate that, <laughs> uh, but my cultural reference points definitely do. Things like grain chill, for example. Um, and um, coming over as a, as a boy, a young boy, um, where I spoke the language, obviously, but it was interesting because um, there were often conflicts around uh, culture, uh, understanding, and um, so it wasn't always easy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't. It it really wasn't always easy. Um, equally, I had many challenges growing up uh, through um, family dynamics. I, I won't go into to that too much, but um, it all of this kind of led me into a space whereby I was quite eager to give back in some sense. And um, so in my, uh, in my, I studied anthropology uh, at university. So, you know, fairly privileged background, uh, UCL. And um, coming out of that, I had really wanted to work with young people, but the ceiling for income was like as low as the floor, yeah. which is uh, an absolute travesty, actually, um, and at a social level, because there needs to be so much more support mm -hmm. for young people if we're going to construct a better society, I would argue. Um, and then I was very fortunate um, in my sort of late 20s. Um, I, 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 it was so odd. It was all before the time of GDPR. So I had interviewed for a position as a researcher for Newham Council, right. and I did not get that job based on a technicality. But the person I interviewed for gave all my details to his uh, partner, who was looking for a project manager to manage a, a health center. In, in a secondary school in Hackney. And I got this call from somebody and she said, oh, hi, uh, I, your details were passed to me by my partner and I, I understand that you might be a good candidate for this job. And, and I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, and ultimately when they talked about a health center, what they were what they were looking to do this was back in 0405 is take community based uh, health services around sexual health mental health drugs and alcohol and rather than asking young people to go to these community spaces we were going to do some tarting up of a dead space within a secondary school um, getting very much the young people's voice and how it was look the look and feel of the place and then coordinate services from there and um, I all of a sudden I had a job in the space that I kind of wanted to work in with young people. I was pretty well paid. Um, and there was like this vision and a future that was emerging for me. But one of the things that really transpired that uh, I didn't know because I was not in this world before, uh, pre prior to that, I was in kind of IT rollout project management space, um, but was this sort of flood of 
boys uh, from year eight and year nine in school. So that's kind of uh, 12, 13, 13, 14. Um, and, and people from the school were saying, I don't understand what's going on. And the services. So these boys were coming to you? Yeah. Because right. I, I was the, uh, even though I was the project manager, I ended up being the face of this, right. the health hut, it okay. was called. Um, and um, yeah, people were saying, oh, what's going on here? And, and the services themselves were, uh, you know, quite taken aback by the figures because uh, their, their figures were transforming when they were in the health hut as opposed to out in the community okay. in terms of did not attend rates. Obviously, that dropped massively, but also the, the, the age and makeup of the service users. So this gave me some insight into, OK, uh, perhaps I'm doing something um, or perhaps it is like this male role modeling perhaps oh, this is oh, what i'm yeah. doing and also i had a sh i had a sort of systemic uh, advantage which is my accent right. because um i'm caucasian obviously um but i don't represent the establishment right okay so my accent was kind of indistinguishable in terms of a a uh, class structure. So all these things were happening, and um, I was getting the kind of positive feedback that I was looking for in a career, um, um, and 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 there was this development forward. So that was the motivator. Nice. So what were these boys coming to you with, 13, 14 year old boys? So some of it was safety. Okay. So um, there were there were, there were a group of young boys that may not find themselves particularly well within the playground, for example, and the social pressures therein. Um, some of it was because. Um, so this is now in London we're talking is, about. Yeah, right? okay. East London, okay. Hackney. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and some of them were coming towards me because of my background and kind of a fascination with America. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it was because. I would go and play football. So I was not a teacher, but I was this sort of older person. Were you kind of like a father figure maybe for a lot of kids? It's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they're they the only ones who could tell you that. Yeah. And, um, and truth be told, truth be told, I have a superpower, which is uh, body popping. So it's a, a, a street style of dance. And, um, Are you going to show us? <laughs> um, not here, not now. Um, but I have competed and I've done international shows. And no. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like a superpower. And 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 all of these things are kind of those uh, nonverbal communication right. pathways, which would put me in a position to be seen. Okay. And uh, this created some intrigue, I think. Uh, so, so, so these boys and young men were coming towards me, it, it, and and irrespective of their backgrounds, it didn't matter whether they were mm -hmm. gang nominals, uh, so people known to the criminal justice system, okay. or young people who were kind of like more interested in just chatting or talking about modern art or whatever it was that they wanted to talk about. Okay. Very interesting. Mm. So in my book, um, which is actually about relationships, so I have two sons, so I talk a lot about my personal experience and also research on boys. Um, what are the main issues that boys face today in your experience? Um, well, I mean, when, when, when thinking about the concept of issues, you, you might want to break it down into sort of a biopsychosocial model okay. for, for, for clarity. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of say, let's just, let's stick with education for, 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 for a moment. Well, and we can, we can go through all three slowly. Okay. Yeah. Why okay. Not? Um, well, uh, the the, the yeah, challenges that uh, say biologically boys might be facing um, is my understanding from which is coming Richard Reeves, which who's a, a, from the Brookings Institute. He set up the American Institute for Boys and Men okay. in America. So a lot of the data comes out of the states, but I think there's probably a chance it correlates pretty well. Um, and he's talking about the sort of developmental delay of of boys um, in terms of their prefrontal cortex development. Right. And the impact this is having in terms so is it comparing of comparing to girls or in yes, general comparing in, to girls yeah. compared to girls, okay. the 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 figure that I've uh, heard is that sort of boys will reach a full uh, 
prefrontal cortex maturation by the age of 26. Whoa. <laughs> Whereas I believe, although I might get this wrong, but let's just get the no, sense actually, of disproportion. Yeah, it's true. We actually talk about that um, in one of our previous talks. Exactly that. And I believe 20th. it's like like 12 for girls or something. 12 for girls? So, so the, 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 the disproportion is really significant. Right. Um, okay. So it could be be that this is something that boys when they're going into the educational sphere are uh struggling with sure. um so that that might be one aspect of things um it, it's it's also boys physically mature later than girls physically mature um so that might be again some of the biological aspects and of course whenever whenever we're thinking about sort of one distinction like gender mm. or sex, you know, boys and girls, there are many intersections within that. So there will be um, aspects around race or culture or ethnicity or so on and so forth. And all of that data, I, I don't have at my yeah, sort right. of yeah. disposal. Let's keep it simple, but yeah, it's yeah. good to break it down yeah. a little bit, I think. Um, so uh, then maybe, so psychologically, um, uh, so for future men, Back in 2018, um, uh, I went and did focus groups with the four areas of service delivery, which I'll explain in a moment. But about mas about masculinity, what does yeah. it mean? Yeah. Um, and um, unsurprisingly, I think, uh, the younger the boys were, mm -hmm. the more they felt a pull towards what we might call traditional norms. So provider protector. Right. Um, we used this. Uh, we used a sort of card game, if you want, where we had um, strongly agree to strongly disagree, and then a series of kind of prompts, like, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, it, it, how would you feel? Uh, you know, is it? Are you more masculine if you earn more than your partner, or something along those right. lines? And that would very frequently go towards strongly agree, mm -hmm. especially when they were younger. By the time they were older and, and fathers, mm -hmm. that was very much. In a different distribution okay. um so thinking about why those things might be and you know I, I had these qualitative discussions um boys were sort of saying things like well you know i'm i want to i want to catch the attention of a, of a girl i i I've, i feel like i want to stand out um and whether whether I might say to them well there are lots of different ways to stand out mm -hmm. um there there were sort of tendencies and norms towards kind of boisterous behavior, acting out, um, sort of displays of uh, silliness, mm -hmm. um, types and sometimes anger, mm -hmm. sometimes aggression, things to catch the attention from their perspective of the opposite sex. So maybe that was some of the some of the psychological drivers. And then socially, I mean, if we take just school exclusion, mm -hmm. which is uh, often a very pivotal moment uh, for, for, for young people because if a person finds themselves permanently excluded into school, they go into a, a quite marginalized area of society. And there, say, boys uh, as, a, as a single unit are three times more likely to be permanently excluded than girls. Um, and the reasons why that might happen are multiple. Um, but, um, yeah. So, so these are some of the things that might be going on for boys in those sort of. This lines. is boys, kind of what in their teens we're talking about. Or? Yeah, yeah. So again, going back to to the space of education, we since since the year nineteen eighty. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this this data comes from the states, but where um, completion of tertiary education was split fifty fifty female. Yeah. And now, uh, sort of forty four years later. It very much skewed females mm. are coming out of, of university um, with qualifications and fewer, fewer and fewer boys are going into tertiary education. Mm. So why is that, you know? Uh, I, there are uh, a number of a number of theories. Um, and again, a, a lot of so this, this US based. This is, a okay. lot of it's coming from the US. Um, so so 
cost of education yeah, is definitely that's a pillar, that is for sure is definitely going to be a I wonder prism. if Europe where education is free is the same I would yeah I don't imagine that probably not yeah I I, I don't I don't mm. I don't know um, but there's certainly a reduced barrier to entry for sure, yeah. um, and then so and so so there's this kind of um, perhaps economically rational discussion about the value of education relative mm. to the field um, per, perhaps it is that there are some um, young people today who are just saying, you know what, there are lots of different ways that I can yeah. build a career um, as long as I have an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, yeah, my younger son is saying that. I don't agree. <laughs> right. I'm like, no, yeah. you'll finish university. After that, you can do whatever you want to do. Yeah, I, I, would, tend to, I would tend to say the same thing. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. After that, yeah. do what you want to yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. So we touched a little bit about um on the term masculinity mm. and i think over the last maybe decade we've heard a lot about toxic masculinity mm. so let's talk about positive masculinity what is mm -hmm. that well let's i think let's let's before we get into that let's address that elephant in the room about sure. toxic masculinity okay. um and it's a term that um uh, it has been around since the early 90s. Um, I think it was in 1992 that the term was uh, first coined. Um, and then in in my recollection, it really took a, a pivotal moment with that Gillette ad in 2018. I don't know if you remember that one, where it was called, um, it, it, their strapline was a best a man could get. Yeah. And then they pivoted that strapline to something which I forget now, but it was a play on this. And the whole advert was talking about um where 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 boys young men and men are having a negative impact on society that was the whole right. thrust of the advert um and then i recall very much that the this term toxic masculinity which had been around but really mushroomed right. into the, okay. the you know everyday parlance um and yet it it's not something that is fully uh, fully defined and I that's 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 fine these these social terms will mean different things to different people but I think they can mean both um, by males towards society mm -hmm. and also within males and sometimes from society towards males mm. and I think that there's the there are these um, sort of three uh, three ways in which this these outcomes can sort of manifest and often when people talk about the outcomes it refer to things like suicide rates right uh, where where men are highly overrepresented mm -hmm. in terms of completed suicides mm -hmm. not necessarily in terms of suicidal ideation okay. i understand that women are twice as likely to experience a suicidal ideation uh, as men in the general pop so there's some consideration about means of, yeah. of completed suicide um, but also as I mentioned before school exclusions uh, completion of education um, uh, entrance into the criminal justice system the kind of list of negative outcomes rough sleeping populations mm. drug addiction alcohol uh, use there are all these different spaces where uh, males are overrepresented. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of the toxic masculinity discussion because men occupy this level of society, the, the politicians, the financiers. I think the, that's uh, an and, interesting point, exactly. And both here, extremes, yeah. Both extremes. Mm. And then I think that what I'm also seeing on social media is that that extreme leads to a lot of defensiveness yeah it, when you hear these terms of toxic masculinity and you'll have people who are on linkedin who by the very virtue of the fact that they're on linkedin yeah. have already separated themselves <laughs> yeah. from the vast society and they will be talking about these poor outcomes for males which are often the people who are not on LinkedIn, mm. okay, as a filter. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in terms of positive masculinity, Future Men um, has seven characteristics, which are really not the preserve of the masculine. Mm -hmm. There, it's about being a good person. Yeah. And these seven characteristics are empathy, mm -hmm. non nonviolence, inclusiveness, curiosity, resourcefulness, resilience, and reflectiveness. And Future Men as an organization has a history which is 35, 36 years um, as from 1988 um, and then as a charity since 20, uh, 2004, so it's our 20th anniversary. And over all of that um, 
uh, evidence base, these were the characteristics when we thought about the cohorts of boys that were and young men that we're working with. These were characteristics that we felt could be developed better. Um, and 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 so these are the this is the underpinning of our work. I think those seven characteristics, um, yeah, very nice and positive for mm. I think everyone mm. <laughs> to adopt. Mm. Um, I think I read on your website, and I think probably elsewhere too. Um, why do mainstream services find it so difficult to engage with boys? So again, it depends upon which service we're right. we're talking about, um, and um, if we look at say. The health the health service and and as as one and we can talk about education and other st stuff but there is this um, there is the a, a kind of um, what's the word a, 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 um, conventional wisdom that men don't present to primary care right, right. if, if yeah, they correct. if they have <laughs> they have issues going yeah. on then it's just it's just pushed back and pushed back um, this is all this will is also, this true or not well. Uh, firstly, this 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 behavior might also come into toxic masculinity. Right. So, uh, just wanted to highlight that. So, in 2013, there was an analysis of presentation to primary care mm -hmm. um, by Wang et al., and they looked at the distribution curves of uh, presentation uh, by by sex, but also um, for sexual health reproduction purposes. So, mm -hmm. they wanted to disaggregate by this, and the finding was very clear that. Uh, boys up until the age of 16, when they're still in the preserve of the family home, mm -hmm. present to primary care just as frequently as girls. Right. And also, from the age of 64 afterwards, right. it's a similar presentation um, to primary care. So one of, the, um, one of the kind of conclusions was where are boys and men predominantly between the ages of 16 and 65? And it's work. You know, mm. at, at a very population level, um, uh, men, young men are still more likely to work longer hours than, than women. And there are lots of different reasons. Of course, child care is a massive aspect within that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they're also more likely to work further away from home. Uh, so you've got commute times that go on top of that. And so this is like kind of a barrier to access. So that so, so that aspect comes into play. Um, I mentioned earlier that I have a background in working in schools, and I have seen firsthand um, how schools can sometimes um, err on the side of caution where there is an act of aggression and, and violence. I've also seen how schools can respond to acts of aggression and violence by girls, but it's not physical. Right. So there's kind of an immediacy aspect sometimes around the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a story, um, uh, working in, in an, another secondary school in, in East London, uh, there was an incident where two boys were kind of going at it. One boy was significantly bigger, significantly stronger than the other one. Um, in the aftermath of everything, it, might even be that the victim ultimately was the first perpetrator right. and the, 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 the person who, you know, beat the living hell out of the other person, speech and language issues, uh, challenges at home, none of it condones or mm. it, it just explains that there may have been some other factors within this. Equal, and that, that boy was immediately and permanently excluded um, without sort of consideration. Um, and I, I also was witness to a long term, a sustained psychological attack on one girl by a group of girls yeah. that just kept going. And this girl over time developed um, eating disorders, uh, started to self harm, excluded herself from school. And these girls just stayed in the school, mm -hmm. even though there was a, a, a very solid understanding of the persistence of the attack of the, uh, but it was it was almost as if it was distinguished differently yeah i think it's interesting you say that um, i read a thing ages ago uh, by a columnist in a paper that if you look at the playground where kids are little like four years old you know boys will beat each other up and then they'll be friends in the next five minutes whereas the girls will even at that young age just psychologically kind of 
you know, work against each other. Mm. And I think that maybe persists mm. <laughs> throughout <laughs> throughout the ages. Mm. Um, so are you finding any simili like similarities or patterns um, of the characteristics of boys that are struggling? I think the 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 overarching um challenge that that many of our cohort um face is deprivation right so there is a metric uh that is publicly available called the index of of multiple deprivations um and and this is a it's an online database that you can go and have a look at your postcode for example okay. and then it will give you a scale of uh, one to ten, where one is the most deprived decile and ten is the least deprived or most affluent. Right. Um, Fifty-eight percent of the young people that we work with hold postcodes in the three most deprived deciles. Wow. Um, and so this is a significant cohort within a group of about 1,300 young people that we work with over the course of a year at Future Men. Um, and that is that 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 has so many ramifications so during the pandemic for example um we we were supporting boys who were completing their gcse's on their mother's phone using data because they didn't have mm. the 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 connectivity at home um uh, as as a form uh, i mean that's a significant disadvantage and of course that disadvantage does not know sex that yeah, that will yeah. if there if if that boy has a sister that sister will be facing right. the same disadvantages um we were uh, so but i'm just i'm just applying the filter that we have mm -hmm. um in our work with uh, young people through the youth services that we provide in westminster we were working with another charity called the felix project to deliver food packages to families who live in pimlico Right. Not an area yeah. that you might not normally associate with deprivation, and made a veil, uh, which is arguably, um, from a from a vista point of view, less deprived than Pimlico, but yet where you turn a corner or you go into an estate and you and and then the index of multiple deprivations database will throw out uh, the, the the sort of true understanding of that. Um, so deprivation. Um, race is uh, is is a kind of uh, a key feature of the young people that we're working with but i'm not saying that race is the cause of the challenges that are faced um the the uh, institute for race relations back in 2020 um they produced a report called the uh, pru to pru stand for pupil referral unit um to a prison pipeline and in that document they were really documenting how the english education system and i'm sure it's the same in the states um really marginalizes the experience for black boys and young men so they're talking about the teaching of history for example noting that there is black history month but that within the curriculum only yeah. about 12 percent of the curriculum highlighted the positive contributions that black uh society uh, of the As african diaspora contribute to to the uk and the impact that that has in terms of uh social modeling and the 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 sort of um um, whilst there is 15% um, uh, of the overall UK population is of um, global majority ethnic background, uh, something something like less than 1% of senior leaders in school are from those backgrounds. Yeah. So where does that work? And what what are the what are the structural uh, and systemic racial barriers that some boys and young men face? Mm. And we see that through our cohort. Um, Speech and language um, is, is another um, uh, another kind of um, barrier that we see that that some some of the boys that we're we work with are facing. Um, adverse childhood experiences. That's another thing that we see very frequently. And again, I I don't want to say that this is the preserve of young boys and men and 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 that girls and young women are not experiencing this. Mm. It's just that that's these are things that we face yeah. and we're working with again and again. Okay, and with these kind of marginalised, let's say, or struggling boys and men, um, do you talk about relationships at all? Um, 
We talk about relationships. Uh, so we the, we run a program through the work we deliver in schools, um, and we support the transition from primary to secondary school, mm -hmm. which is often a challenging tr uh, transition, um, but also in the transition of early adolescence, so yeah. uh, years seven, eight, and nine. Um, and we we run a program called the Boys Development Program, and we talk about and the the the, the objective of the program is to support. Uh, attachment to education. So we're not attendance officers. We're not knocking on doors at 7 a.m. and frog marching mm -hmm. boys to school. We're not um, attainment sort of tutor specialists. Yeah. So the attachment is things like um, peer communication, peer relationships, relationships with uh, school staff. So mm -hmm. it's not just about your teacher, but it's also about the the, the, the sort of maintenance and facilities mm -hmm. people and the IT technician. So again, it's this kind of all those characteristics mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Uh, we talk about masculinity mm -hmm. um, and some of the challenges that that might impose upon boys and young men mm -hmm. and those sort of social norms and also how, uh, how we can navigate that through emotional regulation. We talk about communication. So relationships in a very broad sense mm -hmm. not necessarily partnership about partnership partnership relationships no we're not that's not our field of expertise mm -hmm. um that's more in the realm of uh, pshe or rshe relationship se sex and health education that's delivered through schools um of course within any interaction um we, we in uh, on, on an individual basis those conversations will come up and very much in terms of our work with fathers so our work with fathers is our broadest area of work so i was going to say do you what is the age range that you're so uh, uh, when as we work with fathers right that directly impacts birth and uh, you know the uh, yeah. childhood um, but in terms of registered sort of uh, service users who we work with individually it's eight to uh, 19 or 25 with additional needs. Mm -hmm. um, and actually not even additional needs within our work of young fathers. We yeah. classify young fathers as 25 and under. Right. Um, and the, the eight-year-olds we're working with in the youth youth hubs that we deliver in, in Westminster. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was going to touch upon a certain topic. So mm -hmm. in my book, actually, as a single parent, I do touch upon the single parenting aspect quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and just some stats from the UK and the US. So, for example, in the UK, there's under just under 3 million single parents. Mm -hmm. In the UK, so that's 15% of all households. Mm -hmm. um, and women make up 90% of these single parents. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding, then 49 of these single mothers live in poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and also the annual salary is quite different. So a single mother would earn on average 28000 Seven hundred and a single mm. father forty, let's say forty three thousand per year. Mm -hmm. And in the U.S., about ten percent of the families um, live in poverty, mm. and forty percent of them are single mothers. So mm. single mothers live in poverty, and there is a term called persistent poverty, um, which means that these single mothers just cannot raise themselves above a certain platform. And there's also a thing called time poverty, which is mm. less discussed. Mm. Because obviously, if you're raising children on your own. There's very little time left for other things. So in your work, in your line of work, do you discuss this issue? Because obviously, if you're pregnant, if you have a child, one of those people can quite easily walk away, typically. The, to some degree. Typ typ yeah, yeah, to some degree. Easier than a mother, for example. Yeah. Um, is this something that you come across and discuss? or? Well, the first thing, I, I think it's easier for the non-resident parent. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I totally accept everything that, you know, the, 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 the image through the stats that you have uh, painted is very much of single mothers mm -hmm. and, and taking on the, um, I don't want to call it burden of single parenthood because parenthood <laughs> can be a joy, right? <laughs> Um, but, but the financial issues the fi are a burden oftentimes. Yeah. And those financial issues are also felt by the non-resident parents. So right. so, so that, that, that sort of average of 42,000 hides an awful lot. Mm. Um, and the first thing that it might hide is that you know, divorced men are nine times as likely to take their own life as divorced right, females. Yeah. Mm. So psychologically, divorced males struggle significantly. And obviously... Uh, suicide is the nth degree of a spectrum of significant psychological Why challenge. is that actually? I've always wondered. Why do men struggle so much more? 
in divorce. Psychologically? Yeah. Well, I mean, there will be lots of different issues. Uh, and, and for some, there will be access to children. Mm -hmm. um, that That is a significant driver. Mm -hmm. But also the, the aspect of relative poverty for, you know, when you take an average, you over egg on the outliers, yeah, sure. right? Um, and it hides an awful lot. So as, as I was saying, the the... Um, the the reality for many non-resident parents is that, and this was all sort of featured by the DWP, they did some deep analysis mm -hmm. on, on child maintenance, that fathers or non-resident parents okay. are financially better off if they never see their child. Right. So with housing costs being what they are, if, um, for example, you have two children and you, at that point, you certainly need another bedroom. And of course, there's all different manners. Like if your child is not the same sex as yeah. you, you certainly needed a separate bedroom. And even within what might be considered not even ideal, but just, you know, um, sort of uh, the, the, the norm, you would want a second bedroom for yeah, your child. Sure, yeah. but if you have two children and you want sort of multiple bedrooms, then actually you get into a point whereby you are better off financially not seeing your ch child and paying the maximum of child maintenance service, um, which is something that actually Future Men recently through a, a report that was published by the jo Joseph Roundtree Foundation um, that was talking about a minimum income standards. Mm. Um, and we were working with an academic and they were talking about how actually non-resident parents need to be thought of in a very different way. Okay. I think the overall perspective is for single parents, whether they're resident or non-resident, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. You know, um, so and, and going back to your question about psychologically, so that you've got you've got kind of potentially aspects of it could be that they felt kicked out, something like seven in 10 divorces are initiated by females mm -hmm. um, here in the UK and in the US. Yeah. So there might be something around that. Uh, there might be a reduced access to children, mm -hmm. um, which which could be extreme and like actually no yeah. access. But even even in a, a kind of good or ideal standard, it's very rarely 50 50. Yeah. Um, and actually, I, I've, I, I, I don't know the statistics, but I would wonder what 50 50 looks like in reality because and and where's the child in all of this where is the child trying to move their bags between these two spaces and how how close do they have to live to one another i mean i had a friend and they shared the daughter every two weeks so the, oh so two weeks on, with one yeah two, two weeks, weeks right. which i thought was very bizarre for a child and, and then when we challenging, right? It's quite weird. She had to pack the bags and yeah. she, where's where's her home at the end of the day? Right. And so when I was splitting up with my ex, we actually like read up quite a bit of it and the child needs to feel home somewhere. Right. So even if the non residential parent sees them a little bit less, mm. it's beneficial for the child to feel home. Right. Somewhere. That makes so, sense. Yeah. That makes total sense. Two weeks and two weeks. I can't even you know how it is when you go on a holiday and you come back with all yeah. the bags? That's my worst nightmare. I'm yeah, packing. Yeah. Let right. alone I would have to do that every two weeks. It's yeah. Like, and, and it might not be a holiday in this Yeah, case, there we go. You know? yeah. Um, no, I've, I've, and I've, I've heard of some situations. And I, again, I'm sure this is all changes over time. The age of the child will be quite yeah. a determinant around this. But I've heard of situations where it's like three days, two uh, you know, three days, four days, four days, three days and flip flopping. But I don't understand what the circumstances are that would permit that. Like next door neighbors? Is this how that yeah, works? Yeah, we used or? to live just down the road from each other. Right, we okay. We had about five houses in between. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Which to any yeah. guy I was seeing was very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. Yeah. It's just convenience. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the stories, yeah. man. Let's move on from that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> but just coming back to the, yeah. the concept, the, the aspect of, of of fatherhood, and of course, you know, it's when you're talking in generalizations, you, it's a bit like talking about men and women. Who is this men person? Who is this women person? Well, they're not one singular uh, no. aspect at all. Um, but um, there, there, there are still within the space of fatherhood in the UK, um, there is a call. Uh, which has been going on for a number of years to um, have m men participate more in childcare yeah. and nurturing. The, and actually thinking about how that ties into masculinity, 
um, Future Men is very much of the the, the mindset that um, engaging men uh, early on to take a, as much of a caregiving role as they can, this is an area where potentially the norms around provider protector, which look like resource creation and protection of resource and protection of this sort of nuclear family, if you want, this is an area where there could be a potential paradigm shift, mm. right? But in order to really facilitate this paradigm shift, there needs to be, again, this aspect of access, which I talked mm. about in terms of healthcare, right? Um, and access looks like paternity leave. Yeah. And the UK has the worst paternity yeah. leave in, in Europe. Um, and I think it's like... Uh, ranked third in the OECD nations. So it's really not fit for purpose. Yeah. Um, and even though we have shared parental leave, yeah. uh, which came through in 2015 and allows for parents to decide how to allocate the first year, it's really a transfer of maternity leave by the mother to the yeah. father. So that that's a, that's a bar barrier. It's kind of a take some of this and um, and and really, you know, I think it's fair to say, and sort of ethnographic research says this, mothers do want to spend time bonding with their children. But you also have to. It's a biological need well, for the child. I, I might argue that. So I might argue I'm from that. Slovenia, so right. Europe has this. So we have one year full paid maternity, whatever you were earning when you were working. Mm -hmm. Okay, our taxes are slightly higher. Mm -hmm. We have one year full maternity leave. Mm -hmm. um, the father can take it as well for a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have a kindergarten system where the child is one and they go into like a very nice uh, mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. and then the mother can go back to work. Mm -hmm. So here what I've experienced is that women come to work, I don't know, after three months and then they have nannies taking care of the child. Mm -hmm. How does the child even know who the parent is and bond properly with the child? So I find it here in the UK, it's very tough to have a child. It's I, and, and in America. And America, yeah, exactly. Even, I'll write that about in the book as well. Yeah. Three different countries. It's brutal. Yeah. Like zero maternity leave. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how is yeah. it possible? You've given birth to, yeah. like, a new human being. It doesn't, it, it you, honestly doesn't make sense. You have women crying at work because they yeah. can't, they can't, they can't handle it. No. You know, time to heal, like, physically, no. psychologically. No. Um, and, 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 and that's, I, I, you do have to question well, why are we doing this? Mm, yes, very true. Um, very true. And and what are what are the dynamics that lead to uh, an inability to move it to a different space? Mm. It's a big question, right? Um, so so paternity leave, and and there are many calls for extending paternity leave from two weeks to six weeks. Yeah, there are calls to go even further, but let's take the the yeah, next best yeah, step, yeah. Um, and also to uh, to 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 um, actually finance this because yeah. statutory paternity leave, um, which is like one hundred and forty seven pounds a week, excludes so many people who are not earning good amounts of money who can kind of take that hit. So where there is uh, where are men's earning sort of sixty k or more the uh, the uptake of paternity leave is around the 85% mark. Right. And for those who are earning 20K or less, it's around 33%. Because you literally cannot it's afford just, it. Because, and, and at that point, there's this kind of economic rational discussion I would imagine that's happening internally. What's the best thing I can do for this child? Yeah. It's actually about creating the resources that yeah. re are required, you know. Um, so, so that's one aspect. Um, the fact that paternity is not a recognized prote uh, protected characteristic in the Equality Act of 2010. Um, and and I, I, I hear some people call uh, for actually um, not just paternity, but caring, mm. uh, because caring is obviously something that we, d we might be doing for youngers, but we might be doing for olders as well. Mm -hmm. So that that caring characteristic is one that's kind of has a has a sort of arc of travel. Um, but the fact that paternity isn't and uh, therefore there are no protections in terms of yeah. uh, employment law and discrimination, um, although I, I do want to say that I've heard many stories that where uh, mothers after birth are still sort of performance managed into into a corner. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard other stories around um a grievance after um, um, 
oh gosh, when, when a woman loses a baby, yeah, what, the miscarriage, miscarriage. I yeah. beg your pardon, that's the word I was looking for. That 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 there's very little sympathy in those spaces. So I'm I'm not yeah, all, all of my narrative. I hope is coming through. Is not yeah. it's not just about boys and young men. Yeah, no, it's for just sure. that. There are challenges. I think Europe is a little bit better yeah. in that respect, I have to yeah. say. Whereas yeah. I think kind of in the more yeah. developed world, it's very brutal. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, these are some of the policies that we, we are talking about in our advocacy mm -hmm. space. Uh, we, we run an online um, meeting space called Agenda Dad through through Future Men. And, and, and over this past year, we've talked about perinatal pater paternal mental health okay. um, and mental health screenings. Because at the moment, the, the legislature is that a father can only um, ask for a screening if their partner is in receipt of specialist mental health care. So the kind of hoops that have to be gone through in in order for the male to receive a, 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 a screening are quite significant because in order for a mother to be in receipt of specialist care, mm -hmm. They need to have gone through awareness and acknowledgement and act action oriented approach. Uh, they need to have a diagnosis. They need to have support, and then dad can be in receipt of a mental wow. health screening. Okay. Now, of course, I also want to say that any individual can find the apps. They can go on the mm -hmm. uh, One You campaign. They can talk to uh, improving access to psychological therapy. So I don't want to suggest that there's no agency whatsoever, mm -hmm. but there is this kind of exclusion within policy. Um, and then birth registration is another area that we are currently tackling. Um, birth registration being having the, the father's name on the birth certificate. Now, this is one of these phenomena that really doesn't occur that often. So it's about less than 5% of all uh, birth certificates will not have the father on. But if a couple is not married or in a civil partnership, mm -hmm. The mother de facto has parental responsibility and then has to allow the father to be on the certificate. So this is more one of an ethical conversation. Rather, as I say, it doesn't happen all that often, but there is an ethical framework that potentially needs to be discussed. Mm. Um, and this this is what we're discussing at the moment. So there are all these areas where um, fathers are being called on to do more. Yeah. And um, since the pandemic, the, um, the the fathers have increased their contact time with children and are doing more practical care, more emotional nurturing. Um, but if we really want to take the next step, mm. it's great to say to fathers, hey, get on board, guys. But you also need to provide the structural resources in order to do that, um, I, I would argue. Yeah. Okay, that is true. <laughs> um, it's quite funny that I have two boys, you have two girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so anytime anyone asks me about my children, I, you know, when I say I have two boys, they're like, oh, must be so hard for you. Mm. Um, how do you manage that? And mm -hmm. I'm like, no, they're actually so sweet. And they're teenagers. Mm. Well, one isn't even a teenager anymore. Um, what about when you say we had you have two girls? What, what's the reaction? So mine are mine are younger. Mine are twelve and fourteen. Um, but very frequently, um, and and I I live now in 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 an area of Kent. Um, and very frequently, people will say, "Oh gosh, you're you're gonna really struggle when they're like sixteen, seventeen, mm. eighteen, and they're out there." And um, and my my response is. Um, well, my work has kind of taken me into areas of st statistical understanding, not analysis. No, that's beyond my pay grade. But um, whereby I, I kind of retort back, well, there are, everybody's facing different challenges. Yeah. So it depends upon how we understand risk and which risks we're talking about. Right. So in the area of, say, uh, a sexual assault or or um, uh, sort of sexism, I think it's fair to say that my girls are quite likely to experience that in a different way. Again, I hasten to say that um, boys will experience sexism in a potentially a different way. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that this is what masculinity looks like and therefore I have to perform in a certain perspective yeah. approaching women and the, 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 the challenges of rejection and so on and so forth. But that aside, I think it's fair to say that my girls may experience some challenges and so I can have a discussion around that. But in terms of like grievous bodily harm or even like homicide, 
my children are far less likely to experience that, as particularly when thinking about strangers. Right. They are more likely to experience uh, uh, risk from you know, IPV, intimate partner uh, violence. Right. So I can now have a more nuanced discussion right. okay. and not just be kind of single focused on this stuff. Um, and it's interesting when when I do say this, sometimes people will just like, well, what? You know, why How? Why are you going so deep on all this stuff? You think it's good. Why not? This is like, it's facts of life, right? Like, yeah. why would you not discover? Yeah, that? yeah, exactly. And and to be honest, I would, I, I, it's, I've, I, it's often crossed my mind, would I treat this differently if they were boys? Yeah. I think my, I think the content of a lot of my discussions would be kind of primarily do you feel safe to bring your challenges to me? Mm. Right. That's an yeah, access sure. issue. Yeah. Right. Um, and and, you know, touch wood up until this point, um, I have a, a really solid relationship with my daughters mm. and um, they are coming to me with. I wouldn't want to say all their challenges, but a, a good number yeah. so that then I can build a trust that says, you know, dad's OK. We can go to him and he's not going to like lose, you know, lose his crap. Um, um, but it's still about kind of a process of, well, let's think about this from the other person's perspective. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you may have contributed to a, a challenging situation i think that's a good question yeah. let's let's we often don't think about that no let's let's yeah. get that on the table yeah. and and let's be non-judgmental about mm -hmm. that because if we can't if we can't be curious about ourselves yeah. then we're gonna it's always gonna be defensive it's always yeah, gonna be kind of confirmation bias i'm fine yeah, i'm great yeah. you know everyone else yeah <laughs> um and then thinking about you know well where were the miscommunications where were the misunderstandings what can we do from here how do you want me to get involved like how that. much of you yeah. do you want to put into this at what point do you want to kick in the safety valve and i'll be there mm -hmm. and we we kind of construct a plan for yeah. for managing challenges yeah, like, but i don't think that would be very different if i had boys maybe just a different topic but it's the same thing they need to be able to come to you and discuss, yeah that's right so. yeah 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 okay very interesting chris <laughs> <laughs> uh is there maybe like a key takeaway message uh that you would like to leave our viewers and listeners with today i think the 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 key the key with well, a couple of keys yep particularly around the discussion of uh, gender relations, gender politics, um, men are not one thing, mm -hmm. nor women. Uh, there's always intersectionality within that. Um, and that there are challenges that are faced for, for, for both sexes in different ways and, and being more nuanced about the conversation, uh, ideally with a, an idea that if we support this sex, we support that sex. And if we support this sex, then we're supporting that sex. And we're, it's all about kind of trying to build a greater awareness and understanding um, of, of the strengths and weaknesses of where we are. I, I'd say that that's kind of communication. It comes back to that. Yeah. You know? I think, mm. you know, we're here, we should be working and living with each other in a, in a good way. Yeah. Like not. Yeah. Yeah. This is that, this is yeah. that. But we should be coming together yeah. in a positive way. Equally, of course, when there are boundaries that are transgressed, that needs to be responded to appropriately. Yeah. And appropriate is an interesting com conversation to have as well to define what what is what is the immediate stop, mm -hmm. but what is the conversation thereafter? All right. Um, and and that, that can be difficult to have. Um, so again, one of the, one of the programs that we have delivered through mm -hmm. future men is a program for m males who have known to perpetrate domestic abuse and violence Right. and really taking a kind of public health approach again, like, okay, acknowledge what you did. Mm -hmm. Right. And now let's kind of unpack some of this, not necessarily from a psychoanalysis or psychodynamic perspective. Because that's not where we're at as an organization. We are a charity that's delivering services. Mm. We have very skilled practitioners, but we're not at that level. Yeah. Um, but it's very much taking that kind of approach where we don't believe that the primary route into this world is to perpetrate an act of abuse or violence. Yeah. And that there are stages, but there's also a hard stop. 
Okay. Thank you so much, Chris, for being my guest. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.